All right, guys. A very good evening and a very warm welcome to this live class on your upcoming SSC CGL exams brought to you by Talent Sprint. I hope all of you are in good health, and so is your preparation for all the exams. And by the way, I also uh, get to learn that the SBI clerks notification has been released recently, and we have eight thousand vacancies to be filled for the junior associates positions. I'm sure all of you are gonna uh, try for this examination as well. And and I think you must all give it a shot. Uh, the, the syllabus and the curriculum is largely the same. So having prepared for SSC exams or for other bank exams, you should also try for SBA clerks and it definitely is a very, very big uh, organization and a, and a very big brand to be associated with. So all the best to all of you for all your exams and the SBA clerks one, which has been announced recently. I'm sure all of you must have gone through the notification by now. And uh, coming back to this session today, it is on SSC CGL exam. So like what we had done in our earlier sessions, we'll be taking up questions from the last year's paper and solve it here in a smart way wherever possible, right? But overall, the story is simple the more you practice the easier it gets whatever be the subject right be it quantitative aptitude or general intelligence or english language or general knowledge is different so i would not consider general knowledge in this category but you know it's a game of practice so practice would help you reduce your imperfections right so keep practicing right keep solving as many questions as possible but keep one thing in mind do not solve questions for the sake of solving it like you have taken a previous year paper and then uh, it, it has got 100 questions and you give yourself 24 hours to solve it that's not going to help right that kind of a practice would not help you you need to practice in the real like environment right you should give yourself one hour like what you actually get in the exam and then see how many questions are you able to solve it solve in in that one hour of time right so that practice every day regularly would would make you get used to this whole uh, whole examination pattern and, and the time format that you have right and then managing time would automatically get easier for you because you have tuned your body your brain to that one hour of time on a daily basis before you go for the real exam right so just keep that in mind when you're practicing let me now get started with the uh, questions that we have like always i will share my screen with you give you a few seconds to try the question yourself and then take it up for discussion so let me present the first question to you all which is i mean there are questions from different topics here but let's get started with the first one which is on your screens now okay hold on looks like there's some challenge with the setup here give me a minute apologies for this guys just give me a minute let me present the first one yes the question is on your screens now you have got 30 seconds to try this and your clock starts now Okay, so here's the question. It says PQRS is a cyclic quadrilateral. If angle P is three times the angle R and angle S is five times the angle Q, then the sum of angles Q and R is. Now, this is a basic uh, question on, on cyclic quadrilaterals and I'm sure uh, 
with with your understanding on quadrilaterals and spe cyclic quadrilaterals especially you should be able to solve this in less than 15 seconds so what does it say it says pqrs is a cyclic quadrilateral now you know what a cyclic quadrilateral is right a cyclic quadrilateral is the one where all the vertices like in this case pqr and s lie on a circle right so let's say if if you have a circle here pqrs Is a cyclic quadrilateral. I mean, it doesn't look like a straight line. Just try and imagine the so PQ uh, RS. Right? So this is a cyclic quadrilateral, and as you can see, all the four vertices PQ R and S lie on the uh, circle there. Now it says angle P is three times the angle R. Angle P here is three times angle R. So let's assume angle R is alpha. Angle P is going to be three alpha. And angle S is five times angle Q. Angle S is five times angle Q. Let's assume angle Q is beta. So what is angle S gonna be? Five beta, right? It, five, it is five times angle Q. Then what is the sum of angles Q and R? What is Q plus R? So basically what is alpha plus beta is what we need to uh, find out here. Now how do you uh, how do you solve this? Simple, the, the one thing that you must know is that the sum of opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral is 180 right opposite angles add up to 180 so i can say angle p plus r is equal to 180 degrees and angle q plus s is also equal to 180 degrees and i think you don't really have to put these steps on paper you can cut down that uh, paperwork there you, you you should in fact start with directly the values here like uh, p is 3 alpha r is alpha so 3 alpha plus alpha is 4 alpha 4 alpha is 180 implies alpha would be 45 degrees right 180 by 4 is 45 and in this case q plus s so beta plus 5 beta 6 beta is 180 so beta would be beta would be sorry beta would be equal to 30 degrees so what is sum of q and r q and r is alpha and beta together alpha and beta together is 75 degrees which is option here in this case so option 2 75 degrees is the answer now the concept is simple the question is very simple i'm sure all of you will be able to get the right answer in the exam what matters is how quickly do you arrive at this answer and that solely depends on the number of steps that you write on paper honestly me writing p plus r equal to 180 or q plus s equals to 180 degrees on on paper here was a waste of time i should not have done that right you should simply take up the values there or the variables there alpha plus 3 alpha 4 alpha is 180 so alpha is 45 beta plus 5 beta 6 beta is 180 so beta is 30 you know these are simple mental uh, calculations uh, that can be done easily and then alpha plus beta would be 75 degrees so cut down the paperwork to the extent possible so that you can save your precious time in the exam okay next question on your screens here now this is on percentages it says sudha saves 15 percent of her income if her expenditure increases by 20 percent and savings increase by 60 percent then by what percent has her income increased how do you solve this now so that saves 15 percent of our income now if you see all the values here are percentages right she says 15 percent of our income her expenditure increases by 20 percentage savings increase by 60 percentage and what we eventually want is also a percentage value right by what percent has her income increased now like we have uh, seen multiple times in the past whenever you have to deal with percentages you can uh, start with the initial value as 100 so let's assume her initial income is 100 rupees right she saves 15 percent of her income 15 percent of 100 is 15 rupees which means she's spending 85 rupees expenditure is 85 savings is 15 total income is 100 now look at the next part of the question if her expenditure increases by 20 percentage this is expenditure right and here is savings expenditure increases by 20 percentage this has increased by 20 percentage so 20 percentage increment on 85 is what see 10 percent of 85 is 8.5 20 percent would be 17 so 85 plus 17 is 102 her new expenditure e dash let's say is 102 and savings increase by 60 percentage this is savings it increases by 60 percentage it goes up by 60 percentage 60 percent of 15 is 9 these are again these are the calculations that you should do without paper without using paper right 60 percent of 15 50 percent is 7.5 half right 50 percent is half so 7.5 10 percent is 1.5 you understand 60 percent is being looked at as 50 percent plus 10 percent so 7.5 plus 1.5 is 9 so this is 9 increases by 9 so what's the new value 15 plus 9 24 new savings is 
24. So savings is 24, income is, sorry, expenditure is 102. So what will be the new income? New income I dash, let's say, it will be 102 plus 24, which is 126. That's it, there ends the matter. Initial income was 100, the new income is 126. What is the in percentage increase in income? 26%. Option 3, right? 100 on, I mean, 100 becomes 126. It is 26 percentage jump. Now, it doesn't really matter whether the original income was 100 or 200 or 250 or 4000 or 143000. Doesn't really matter, right? When you play around with these percentages, the final percentage change would come out to be 26 percentage, whatever be the original value, right? Uh, next question. Next question. On your screens this one is from algebra we have dealt with these questions in our earlier sessions as well and it's a common uh, question type uh, when it comes to the ACC exams right uh, this one says a plus 1 by a is 3 so what is a power 4 plus 1 by a power 4 these should be uh, like really easy to solve for you now given that you have been practicing for this exam uh, for, for a long time now right for, for the last few months so try it out I, I think you should be in a state where you answer this without writing anything on paper in about five seconds. Let me see how do you do it now. Ideally five seconds, but given that some of you are new to this, I'll, I'll give you some more time. A plus one by A is three. So what is A power four plus one by A power four? Is it done 47 is the right answer yes option two how do you solve this see it says a plus 1 by a equals to 3 then what is a power 4 plus 1 by a power 4 equal to now it's simple a plus 1 by a is 3 let's square it on both sides so what happens when you square on both sides it becomes a squared plus 1 by a squared plus see a plus b the whole square right so a squared plus b squared plus 2ab so 2ab will be 2 into a into 1 by a which is equal to 9 so if you see a and a gets cancelled here this plus 2 i mean you subtract 2 on both sides so it becomes a squared plus 1 by a squared is 9 minus 2 7 we are not there yet we have we are only arrived halfway now we what we need is a power 4 plus 1 by a power 4 repeat the same operation we have squared on both the sides do it again right so square this and square this you getting it we are squaring the equation again so what happens this becomes a power 4 plus 1 by a power 4 and the same thing again plus 2 into a squared into 1 by a squared which is 49 a squared and 1 by a squared gets cancelled subtract 2 on both sides so we are left with a power 4 plus 1 by a power 4 equals to 49 minus 2 which is 47 so option 2 47 is the right answer the point to be noted is sorry this is a power 4 a power 4 plus 1 by a power 4 is 47 now the point is point to be noted is do we really need to write all these steps on paper no not necessary in my view why you have solved such questions right you know when you square it for the first time you will have a extra 2 on the left hand side you have to deal with it what do you do subtract 2 on both sides so when i square it for the first time i end up with a square plus 1 by a square 3 square is 9 but I'll have to subtract 2 from that so that leaves me with 7 so a squared plus 1 by a squared is 7 repeat the same operation a power 4 plus 1 by a power 4 with an extra 2 gives me 49 subtract 2 on both sides we'll get 49 minus 2 47 so you should be like 
okay yes a plus 1 by a is 3 so answer would be 9 minus 2 7 and then 14 minus 2 47 not even 5 seconds in my view like, like, like for example let's say it is uh, a plus 1 by a is equal to 5 let's take one more example a plus 1 by a is 5 so what is a power 4 plus 1 by a power 4 how do you do it 5 squared is 25 minus 2 is 23 23 squared 23 squared is 529 minus 2 would be 527 so 527 will be your answer you get it as simple as that okay next question on your screens now this is from trigonometry all right let's see how many of you are able to crack this cos theta upon 1 minus sin theta plus cos theta upon 1 plus sin theta is equal to 4 theta ranges between 0 degrees and 90 degrees and then what is the value of tan theta plus cosecant theta now there are two ways of solving this question see we know cos theta by 1 minus sin theta plus cos theta by 1 plus sin theta equals to 4 and we also know that theta is between 0 and 90 degrees so you can take your chance by assuming what can theta be like you can try 30 degrees 45 degrees 60 degrees let's say if you put 30 degrees here if it comes out to be 4 then you know theta is 30 and substitute same 30 here in this equation tan 30 and cosecant 30 if not try with 45 if not try with 60 but that is risky right substitution is risky I mean not risky it may take longer than what you really need to uh, spend in, in that particular question so unless you have no other way of solving the question you go for substitution right and that's a simple method to follow so I'm sure you can do it yourself in this solution here I'm going to explain you how to solve it traditionally meaning playing with those trigonometric identities right cos theta by 1 minus sin theta plus cos theta by 1 plus sin theta what expression was what, what algebraic expressions what equations can be used what identities can be used to arrive at the answer so here we go right what do we do see uh, it is cos theta by 1 minus sin theta plus cos theta by 1 plus sin theta equals to 4 now let's take you know the LCM so what happens in the denominator will have 1 minus sin theta into 1 plus sin theta yes or no the denominator is going to be 1 minus sin theta into 1 plus sin theta now a plus b into a minus b is a squared minus b squared right so that is going to be 1 square minus sin square theta which is 1 minus sin square theta and 1 minus sin square theta is cos square theta so I can directly write cos square theta in the denominator see that's how you avoid the number of steps that you put on paper right no point in writing 1 minus sin square theta first and then changing it to cos square theta right you should be able to evaluate that mentally so cos square theta is the denominator look at the numerator now this is cos theta into 1 plus sin theta right so that gives you cos theta plus cos theta sin theta plus look at the other part cos theta into 1 minus sin theta so that gives you cos theta minus cos theta sin theta which is equal to 4 so this plus cos theta sin theta minus cos theta sin theta gets cancelled and we have 2 cos theta here also that 2 cos theta yeah also cos theta and this cos theta gets cancelled we are left with 2 by cos theta equals to 4 or cos theta equals to 2 by 4 which is 1 by 2 yes or no cos theta is 2 by 4 which is 1 by 2 for what value of theta is cos theta 1 by 2 for theta equals to 60 degrees i mean that's something that you need to learn by heart right you should know all these basic trigonometric ratios right for theta equals to 60 I mean theta equals to 0, 30, 45, 60 and 90. What are the trigonometric ratios? Sin theta, cos theta, tan theta, cot theta, cosecant theta and 
uh, secant theta. So cos theta 1 by 2 implies theta equals to 60 degrees and now your job is done. You know that theta is 60. Theta equals to 60. Substitute the same 60 here. Tan 60 plus cosecant 60. What is tan 60? Tan 60 is uh, uh, root 3. Yes. And cosecant 60. Cosecant 60 is uh, reciprocal of sin 60. What is sin 60? Sin 60 is uh, root 3 by 2. So cosecant 60 should be 2 by root 3. So if LCM is taken, what do we get? Uh, this is 3 plus 2, 5 by root 3. Why don't we have 5 by root 3 here? Yeah, we get 5 by root 3. Yes or no? Root 3 into root 3 is 3. 3 plus 2, 5. 5 upon root 3. 5 upon root 3 is nothing but 5 root 3 by 3. Because there's a root 3 and this gets cancelled and finally we'll have 5 by root 3. So option 3 is the answer there. Right? Option 3 is the answer there. So two ways of solving the question. Either go by substitution or simplify the given equation. And this was a simple one, right? 1 minus sine theta into 1 plus sine theta is 1 minus sine square theta, which is equal to cos square theta. We already have cos theta in the numerator. So just cancel that out and play with it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's take up the next one. Here's a question on time and distance. Time and distance. Let's see how many of you get this right. A train traveling at 44 km per hour crosses a man walking with a speed of 8 km per hour in the same direction in 15 seconds. If the train crosses a woman coming from the opposite direction in 10 seconds, then what is the speed in kilometers per hour of the woman? Now this again is about two bodies moving in the same direction or two bodies moving in opposite direction. You know what are the equations to be used. So use those equations, the time and distance equations to solve the given question. You have 45 seconds for this. Got this time and distance let's try it out so a train traveling at 44 km per hour crosses a man walking with a speed of 8 km per hour in the same direction in 15 seconds so here see you know the general equation right s1 plus or minus s2 equals to l1 plus l2 by t if you learn this equation and understand this equation you can solve any type of question on relative speed from time and distance right s1 plus or minus s2 equals to l1 plus l2 by t now s1 and s2 are the speeds of the two bodies l1 and l2 are the lengths of the two bodies and t is the time so speed equals to distance by time now there are two variants here plus or minus s1 plus s2 or s1 minus s2 when do we use plus when the bodies are moving in opposite direction when do we use minus when the bodies are moving in the same direction right these are the basic concepts so if you look at the first part of the question train traveling at 44 km per hour crosses a man walking with a speed of 8 km per hour in the same direction same direction meaning s1 minus s2 so 44 minus 8 equals to l1 plus l2 what is l1 the length of the train is that given to us no, the length of the train is not given to us. So let's assume length of the train L1 is LT plus length of the man should be considered as zero, right? This length is negligible, right? The Basically the width of the man is negligible compared to the length of the train. So we take it as zero divided by time. Time taken is 15 seconds, right? So basically 44 minus 8 equals to LT plus zero by 15. Now also you need to understand that uh, this right left hand side of the equation is in kilometers per hour and the right hand side of the equation has uh, speed in seconds sorry time in seconds so you either convert this kilometers per hour to meters per second or convert the seconds to hours 
and then you'll get the length in kilometers. You understand the units have to be balanced, right? Uh, whichever way you do, the units have to be balanced. Okay. So 44 minus 8, let's convert this to meters per second. What do you do? Multiply by 5 by 18. So 5 by 18 into 44 minus 8 equals to LT by 15. That's the first equation. You can actually solve for LT from this. What is the length of the train? See, 44 minus 8 is 36. 36 by 18 is 2. 5 into 2 is 10. 10 into 15 is 150. So I can say length of the train is equal to 150 meters. Now use the same length of the train in the other equation. The other equation is when the train is crossing a woman coming from opposite direction. So now we have to add the speeds. The speed of the train remains the same 44 plus the speed of the woman which has to be evaluated right speed of the woman has to be calculated so let's say sw equals to length of the train 150 length of the woman should be taken as zero divided by time taken is what 10 seconds and this should be converted to meters per second do the work so 50 150 by 10 is 15 this is equal to 15 15 here goes three times 3 into 18 is 54 so what's with the speed of the woman 54 minus 44 10 10 kilometers per hour of course you getting it 3 times 18 is 54 54 subtract 44 on both sides so we get speed of the woman as 10 kilometers per hour which is option one a very simple question important to be noted is the equation there s1 plus or minus s2 equals to l1 plus l2 by t a lot of variance can be asked in the same uh, you, you know in, in the same concept right we can have two trains crossing each other two trains moving in the same direction you can have a train and a car you can have a train and a pole train and a flag post you can have a train and a man train and a platform all these type of questions can be answered using this one formula s1 plus or minus s2 equals to l1 plus l2 by t so don't just learn the formula by heart but understand the working behind it and when do you use plus when you use minus that clarity if you have you should be able to solve it solve such questions uh, without any difficulty okay uh, moving on let's take up a question on number systems now on your screens if a 10 digit number 2094x843y2 is divisible by 88 then the value of 5x minus 7y for the largest possible value of x is that's a different type of question, right? What will be the value of 5x minus 7y for the largest possible value of x? I'll leave you with this question for about a minute. The clock is ticking now. Got it? Option four, six is what one of you have marked. I think it's time to take this up. So it says if a 10 digit number 2094x843y2 is divisible by 88, then what will be the value of 5x minus 7y for the largest possible value of x? Now look at this 10 digit number. We have 2094x843y and 2. The number has to be divisible by 88. Now we have discussed this in the past, right? How do you check divisibility for numbers as high as 88? I mean, we have learned divisibility rules for 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 
seven, eight, nine, ten, etc. Right? But how do you check it for ETA? Simple logic. Factorize the number ET8 in all the possible ways. Pick up the pair which is co primes. Now, what is co primes? Two numbers are co primes if their highest common factor is 1. So, for example, 88 can be taken as 1 into 88, 2 into 44, uh, 4 into 22, 8 into 11, and so on, right? So, all these are factors of 88 basically 1, 2, 4, 8, and, and 11, etc. Now, if, if you look at all these, 8 and 11 is a pair that is co-prime right 8 and 11 the highest common factor is 1 so and others are not like for example 2 into 44 2 and 44 are not co-primes there the highest common factor is 2 for 2 and 44 the HCF is 2 4 into 22 the highest common factor is 2 again right 8 into 11 is the only pair which gives you highest common factor is 1 so for checking the divisibility for 88 now you need to simply go by divisibility for 8 and divisibility for 11 which means if a number is divisible by 8 and by 11 then you can conclude that the number is divisible by 88 as well you're getting it any number that is divisible by both 8 and 11 is definitely divisible by 88 so instead of checking it for 88 we'll now go and check for 8 and 11 okay 88 is 8 into 11 these are co primes now how do you check for 8 first of all what is the rule for 8 last three digits the last three digits have to be divisible by 8 so 3 y 2 this number is in 300s so what value of y remember x and y both belong to what 0 to 9 these are digits right they can take any value from 0 to 9 so maybe you can substitute y equals to 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and check what value of y what value of y gives you uh, a three digit number that is perfectly divisible by 8 or that is actually divisible by 8 without leaving any reminder so what value of y can be taken see 300 if you see 3 uh, 8 uh, 320 is the multiple of 8 right so i think y can take uh 5 y can be equal to 5 because 352 is divisible by 8 You're able to follow 352 is 320 plus 32 320 so it's, it's basically 44 times so y can be either 5 or yeah the only possible value of y is 5 you're able to follow 302 312 and you can you can verify this mentally you don't have to write on paper i'm just putting it here so that i can explain this to you 362 372 382 and 392 are the values right so you know that 320 is divisible by 88 so 3 not and and before 320 we'll have 3 okay 312 is also possible 240 plus 72 so 312 and 352 these are the two values of y others are not possible 302 is not divisible by 8 322 is not 332 342 362 372 382 392 all these are not is 392 divisible by 8 yes 392 is also divisible by 8 so there are multiple values of y y can be 5 y can be 1 or y can be 9 right so these are the three values of y possible values of y okay y can be equal to 1 y can be 5 or y can be 9 or oh, no is 9 possible yeah 9 is possible 320 plus 72 320 plus 32 and 320 minus 8 yeah. so th these are the three possible values of y now let's look at the possible values of x right then we need to find out what is the value of 5x minus 7y for the largest possible value of x now try and understand <coughs> first to find out the largest possible value of x first of all we need to take all the three possible numbers that can be formed using different values of y so what are the three numbers possible i can have 309 sorry 2094 x 843 1 2 or i can have 2094 x 843 5 2 or we can have 2094x 84392 you're getting it we've taken different values of y here 1 5 and 9 1 or 5 or 9 now find out the value of x how do you get the value of x check the divisibility for 11 what is the divisibility rule for 11 
you know that alternating sum right you have to take the sums of alternate digits their difference should be a multiple of 11 the difference of the alternate sum should be multiple of 11 so if you go by that 2 9 x 4 1 and then 0 4 8 3 2 so I think one thing is clear, 0 plus 4 is 4, 4 plus 8 is 12, 12 plus 3 is 15, 15 plus 2 is 17. And that same 17 is going to come in all the three possible cases, right? Because nothing is changing here. 0 plus 4 plus 8 is 12 plus 3 15 plus 2 17. Yeah, so one sum is 17. What is the other sum? The other sum will involve x and the variable value of y. So 2 plus 9 11, 11 plus x is going to be there. So 2 plus 9 11, 11 plus x, whatever that is, then 11 plus 4 15. So if, if you look at it, 2, 9, 4 are common in the other sums, right? I'm trying to simplify the number of steps involved. Okay, in all these sums, 2, 9 and 4 are going to be common. 2, 9, 4. And in fact, x also is going to be common. What is changing is the value of y, 1 or 5 or 9. So 2 plus 9 is 11, 11 plus 4 is 15, 15 plus 1, so 16, 16 plus x or 15 plus 5, 20, 20 plus x or 15 plus 9, 24 plus x. Are getting These are the three sums possible. So get the value of x. What name the value of x? See, this difference should either be 0 or a multiple of 11. This difference that we get here should either be 0 or a multiple of 11. So 16 plus x minus 17 should be 0. When can that be 0? When x is equal to 1. Yes or no? If x is 1, 16 plus 1, 17. 17 difference 17 is 0. So for this to be 0 implies x should be equal to 1. Now here again 20 minus 17 is 3 already. 20 minus 17 is 3. 3 plus what can give you a multiple of 11? 3 plus 8 is 11, right? The maximum that I can take is 8 here. So you're getting it. This implies that the value of x should be 8 because 28 minus 17 is 11. Likewise here, 24 minus 17 is already 7. 7 plus what gives you 11? 7 plus 4, so x should be equal to 4. I hope you are able to follow. 24 difference 17 is 7. 7 plus x should be a multiple of 11. So the 7 plus x should be equal to 11 let's say. So 7 plus 4 is 11. So x equals to 4. So for the different values of y 1, 5 and 9 the values of x corresponding values of x are 1, 8 and 4. Now go back to the question. The question says what will be the value of 5x minus 7, 5 for the largest possible value of x. Among all these values of x what is the largest possible value of x? 8. So x is equal to 8. Now, when is x equal to 8? When you take y equals to 5. Yes or no? We have put y equals to 5. Meaning, x and y are going to be 8 and 5 respectively. So, find out that value. Now, 5x minus 7y. 5 into 8 minus 7 into 5. You're getting it. 5 8 is 40. 7 5 is 35. 40 minus 5, 35 is 5. So, final answer to this question is going to be 5. Option 2. I know this. This appears to be time consuming and it actually is it's not a very straightforward question but not something that you should skip in the exam either right uh, there are three possible values of y depending on the divisibility by 8 each value of y will give you a value of x for the divisibility by 11 you just have to pick up the highest value of x largest possible value of x and the corresponding value of y put these values of x and y in the required uh, value there right 5x minus 7y you get the answer explanation naturally takes longer because i'm not solving it i'm explaining it to you right a lot of this these steps could be done mentally if i were to solve it for myself right so do not go by the time that we have spent here in solving it right it was not a solution it was an explanation and you should understand the difference in these two okay let's move on uh next question let's take up the next one here's the question on Profit and loss. Let's see how many if you get it right.
got it okay i think enough enough time has been spent already but maybe i'll wait for 15 more seconds to see some more responses All right, guys, let's discuss this now. The time is over. Some fruits are bought at a rate of 11 for 100 and an equal number at a rate of 9 for 100. All the fruits are sold at a rate of 10 for 100. Then what is the gain or loss percent in the entire transaction? Right, so we are buying fruits. Some of them were bought at what rate? 11 fruits for 100 rupees. And an equal number were bought at what rate? 9 for 100 rupees. Okay, equal number of fruits were bought at the rate of 9 for 100 rupees. Now this, all, all the fruits bought have been sold at the rate of 10 for 100 rupees. Right, 10 fruits for 100 rupees. So what is the overall gain or loss in this transaction? Right, what is the overall gain or loss in this entire transaction? The selling price is 10 fruits for 100 rupees. What is the total gain or loss percentage? Now, how do you... Uh, work on this some fruits are bought at the rate of 11 for 100 and equal number were bought at the rate of uh, 9 for 100 so you need to focus on this point here right equal number of fruits were bought at the rate of 9 for 100 see I can always find out the price of each fruit here right 11 fruits for 100 rupees meaning what is the cost of each fruit 100 by 11 right in first case what is the cost of each fruit in the second case we are buying nine fruits for 100 rupees so cost of each fruit is going to be 100 upon nine so this is the price of one fruit cost of one fruit in the first case cost of one fruit in the second case equal numbers can be taken let's say i buy five fruits at this price five fruits at this price and then overall 10 fruits were sold at the rate of 10 for 100 and and then you can find out the gain or loss percentage but the challenge here is dividing it by 11 i mean dividing 100 upon uh, by 11 or 100 by 9 is not going to give you a integer value so it, it kind of gets a little clumsy when you have these kind of denominators right so i would ideally avoid this i would avoid this instead what you can do is to deal with this point on equal number of fruits in both the cases and also to deal with this typical uh, denominators or values that we have 11 and 9 you better take a common multiple of 11 and 9 what is the common multiple of 11 and 9 let's take the least common multiple what is the lcm of 11 and 9 because in one case i'm buying 11 fruits in the other case i'm buying nine fruits so let's go by a common multiple 99 let's say least common multiple is anyway 99 right 11 and 9 11 is a prime number the least common multiple is 99 so let's assume that we are buying 99 fruits in each case now again 99 does not sound very simple value it can lead to complexities but try this out 99 fruits in first case and 99 fruits in the second case so this equal number all problem is solved yeah now try and understand i am spending in two ways in first case i have spent some value and in the other part also i have spent some value what are those values see i am buying 99 fruits 11 fruits are available for 100 rupees so if i buy 99 what will be the price 900 so into 9 11 into 9 is 99 so 100 into 9 900 so i have spent 900 rupees in the first part of the transaction here again i am buying 99 nine fruits are available for 100 9 into what gives you 99 into 11 so if this is into 11 if the quantity is into 11 overall cost will also be into 11 so 100 into 11 1100 are you getting it that's the advantage by taking the least common multiple right 99 fruits for 900 rupees in this case 99 fruits for 1100 rupees so my amount spent in the second part is 1100 you're getting it 99 fruits for 900 99 fruits for 1100 11 into 9 is 99 so 100 into 9 9 into 11 is 99 so 100 into 11 
So my total spent is what? 900 plus 1100, 2000 rupees. So overall cost in this transaction, total cost in this transaction is 2000 rupees. Cost of the transaction is 2000. That's it. The first part is over. Now come to the second part. All the fruits, all the fruits meaning what? 99 plus 99, 198 fruits. 198 fruits are sold at what rate? 10 for 100. See, 198 fruits. Yeah, you understand? 10 fruits, the price is 100. Meaning each fruit, the price is 10 rupees. This is simple. Unlike the previous calculation, 11 for 100, 9 for 100. This one is simple calculation, right? 10 fruits for 100 rupees. So each fruit is at 10 rupees. So 198 fruits will be at what price? 1980 rupees. So I will be spending, I mean, I'll be selling these fruits at what price? Total 1980 rupees. Each fruit is being sold at 10 rupees. 198 fruits I have. All the fruits have to be sold. So 198 fruits will be sold at 90, 1980 rupees. That's it. I spent 2000 rupees in the transaction. By selling, I got only 1980 rupees. So I'm bearing a loss. So first and third option are ruled out immediately. It's not a profitable transaction. It's a loss. How much loss? Is it 5% or 1%? 1%. I'm losing 20 rupees, right? On 2000, I'm losing 20 rupees. 2000 minus 20 is 1980. 20 rupees is what percentage of 2000? 1%. So loss of 1%. Option 4 is answer. 1% loss. Do not go by the amount of time that we have spent in solving this. Why? I was not solving it. I was explaining it to you, right? When, when I have to do it myself, I know that this is the working. It'll take half the time or less than half the time that you have spent. This, is, this in my view is a 30 second problem. You can solve it in 30 seconds if you are following the right method, the smart method. And of course, if you're good at numbers, if you can't deal with this 11 for 100, 9 for 100 or their multiples, least common multiple, etc., then it gets complex. So I think very important to work on your numerical skills and try to keep things simple. Try avoiding writing unnecessary steps on paper. One person loss is the answer. Moving on. Uh, the next question. Now this is on simple and compound interest, a very interesting one. Let's see how many of you get it right. Question is on your screens now. A person borrowed a certain sum at 10 percentage per annum for three years, interest being compounded annually. At the end of two years, he repaid a sum of 6,634 and at the end of third year, he cleared up the debt by paying 13,200. What was the sum borrowed by him? What was the sum borrowed by him? Now this is a different question altogether. So I'll give you enough time to try it out, right? In this case, I would say, if, if you haven't tried such questions in the past, ideally you should skip this in the exam. Nothing wrong in skipping one or two questions, right? I mean, this doesn't look like a one minute question when you read it for the first time. So you are, you leave this and move to the next one in, during your exam or even when you're practicing because when you're practicing, you have only one hour for solving 100 questions. After that one hour of practice, you sit with this one and find out what can actually be done with these kind of questions, right? So I think do it with that mindset now that you're not trying to solve it for the exam, you're trying solving it later to understand how to deal with such questions, okay? A person borrowed some money at 10 percentage per annum for three years, interest being compounded annually. At the end of two years, he repaid a sum of 6,634 and at the end of third year, he cleared off the debt by paying 13,200. What was the sum borrowed by him?
All right, should we take it up? Is it done? Okay, I think we have spent enough time guys. Let's take this up now. Now when you actually get down to solving it, you realize that it's a one line equation that you need to write properly. What does it say? A person borrowed a certain sum at 10 percentage per annum for three years, interest being compounded annually. So till here, it's a regular question, right? A sum of money was borrowed at 10 percentage per annum for three years, interest is being compounded annually. So it's a compound interest case and annual compounding, which doesn't make things really complex right it's a regular format now what happens at the end of two years he repaid a sum of 6634 and at the end of third year he cleared of the debt by paying 13200 what was the sum borrowed by him so we actually have to find out how much is the principal amount what is the principal amount that was borrowed p is equal to what let's assume it is p now let's let's understand the person borrowed p at this point of time Right, he, he actually borrowed it for three years, so he should be paying P plus uh, compound interest at the end of three years, right? This is zero years and this is three years. This is the starting point, zero three. However, at the end of two years, there's something that has happened here. At the end of two years, he repaid a sum of 6634. If this, this part was not there, it would have been a regular uh, compound interest problem. But in this case, at the end of two years, a transaction has happened where he has repaid 6634. Right, he has repaid 6,634. And at the end of third year, he's repaid, uh, he's, he's paid 13,200 to clear the debt. Okay, so now the question has to be divided into two parts. Instead of dealing with a time period of three years, let's deal with a time period of two years. Here is two years time period. Right, for the sake of simplicity, let me say this is zeroth year. When he was, he borrowed P, this is second year and this is third year. So at the end of second year, he paid back 6,634. At the end of third year, he paid 13,200 to clear the entire debt, right? Entire debt. Now the point is this first period of two years, what has happened? It is a regular compounding process, right? P was borrowed at 10 percentage per annum, annual compounding, right? It's a compound risk case, 10 percentage per annum for two years, for two years. So what, what will happen at the end of second year? See, try to understand. If you, if you see, 
10 percentage per annum now we will go by our regular format of solving compound interest questions right how do we solve it using the uh, effective percentage formula 10 percentage per annum for two years so a plus b plus a b by 100 will give you what the compound interest for two years is going to be 10 plus 10 plus 10 into 10 by 100 now, do not ask me what is all this we have discussed this multiple times in the past we are using a formula called effective percentage which which helps us get two compound interest very easily so we will get a compound interest of 21 percent at the end of two years overall compound interest would be 21 percent which means after two years your principal will change to what i mean after two years the total value will become what p plus interest p plus interest will be p plus 21 percentage of p you're getting it at this point of time after two years the total amount that you have to repay will be principal plus compound interest so p plus 21 percentage of p now p itself is like 100 percent of p right this is 21 percent of p remember so p plus 21 percent of p is 121 percent of p yes or no 121 percent of p which means he has to actually give 121 percent of p you understand the working behind this 100 percent is the principal value plus 21 percent is interest it is 121 percent of p so at the end of two years, he is supposed to pay 121% of P, out of which he has paid 6,634. See, understand, in the third year, in this one year duration, the interest will be calculated on what? If he has, if he had not paid anything, interest would have been calculated on 121% of P. But he has paid some part of it. How much has he paid? 6,634. So I will subtract 6,634. On the balance amount, the total value accumulated at the end of two years minus 6634 on this balance amount the interest will accrue for the next one year right and you know that for one year for one year simple interest is equal to compound interest or rather compound interest is equal to simple interest you're getting it for one year compound interest is as good as simple interest. so for this one year that 10 percentage will be like a simple interest case only it won't affect anything now this 10 percentage will be on what value on this value but what will be the total value at the end of uh, uh, so, so basically if you see he has paid 13,200 at the end of one year I mean at the end of third year he paid 13,200 this 13,200 was what the 13,200 was principal amount plus the interest earned on that principal amount so, so consider this to be a fresh start this is like a fresh start yes or no? this one year window is like a fresh start so assume that here the principal is this 121 percent of p minus 6634 yes or no i had to pay x out of that x i already paid 6634 so balance is x minus 6634 now that x minus 6634 is my new principal amount on that principal amount if you have to pay 10 percentage interest how much will you pay at the end of one year x plus i mean on that principal plus 10 percentage of that principal as interest so p plus 10 percentage of p so p is this plus 10 percentage plus 10 percentage so p plus this, this is the principal amount. This is equal to the new principal. You're getting it? This new principal plus 10 percentage interest on this new principal will be equal to 13,200 because that's what I'll pay after third year, right? Whatever is the balance, I cleared off by paying 13,200. So in simple words, this can be written as say principal plus 10 percentage of principal is equal to 110 percent of principal. So 110 percent of 121 percent of P minus 6634 is equal to 13,200. That's it. This is the equation that you need to solve. I borrowed P. At the end of two years, it becomes 121% of P. How does it become 121% of P? Because I am taking 10% compounding at a yearly on a yearly basis. So after two years, I'll get 21% compound interest. So that 121% of P was the due out of which 6634 was paid. So this is the balance. On this balance amount, I have to pay an interest of 10% for the last year for the third year so overall that i'll pay at the end of third year is this balance amount plus 10 percentage interest on this balance amount so that can be taken as original value plus 10 percent of original value which is 110 percent of the original value so 110 percent of this that came out to be 13,200. solve for p from this solve for p out of this so basically you know uh, 110 percent is like uh, 110 by 100 which is 1.1 which is 1.1 so 13,200 divided by 1.1 is 12,000 so 121% of P is equal to 12,000 plus 6,634. So 18,634. Simple. Now do the calculation. P equals to 18,634 into 100 by 121. 18,634 
15200 upon 121 when you solve this you get 15400 is the value i mean i'm not going to do the mathematical i mean calculation there for you i'm sure you can do the calculation yourself but 15400 uh, option two would be the right answer 15400 I mean, when you look at the number 18,000 by 120 is close to 15,000. I mean, 18,000 by 1.2 is close to 15,000. So answer can either be 15,400 or 15,600. Had there been only one option in the range of 15,000, I would have considered that. But since there are two options here, 600 and 400, 15,600 and 15,400, you have to be a little careful in, in that calculation part. But I'm sure you can solve this. However, if you're not very confident, like I said, skip this question in the exam, solve the other ones. This may take longer if you are solving it for the first time but eventually it boils down to one equation it all depends on your understanding of how the whole interest thing plays out there right so 110 percentage of 121 percentage of p minus 6634 is equal to 13200 is the equation okay and the rest of it is your numerical scale and with this question let me close the session here i wish i could solve more questions uh, but the time is up we will meet again in our next live class please uh, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you get notified about our live classes and the videos that we upload on a regular basis right on a daily basis we are uploading at least five or six new videos on the youtube channel which you can watch and uh, get your basics right so subscribe to the channel and of course hit the bell icon so that you're notified about all the new uploads and live classes i'll see you in the next session next week until then keep practicing and do take very good care of yourselves bye